What's up, Guru Nation? Let's demystify clinical research. Hey, Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. This one, as the title suggests, is going to be how to get studies for inexperienced sites, meaning zero experience for the principal investigator, and also for the experienced sites. Obviously, I'm going to spend a lot more time on the inexperienced sites because they're the ones that need the help. Once you get experienced, it becomes easier, but but you still want a full pipeline of studies at all times. So this is where companies like my own, so we have DSCS, so Equity Investments, we help sites research naive and experienced sites and everyone in between. We help them get studies. We help them do their feasibilities if they need help. We negotiate your contracts and budgets for you. We'll help you with source documents. We're available to take your calls whenever on any issues ranging from how do we do this initial IRB application to I don't want my employees to quit to my PI just left me. What do I need to do? Basically a shoulder to cry on or your research therapist. We're here to help with all that low monthly fee. Now, Let's get to my sponsors. And the first one, especially for this episode, is Inato. Inato is a free business development company. They get paid by the sponsors for finding sites that are appropriate to work for those sponsors and do studies. Now, the catch is they're not ready yet for the inexperienced sites. You really have to have, for most of the studies I've seen, experience. That might change in the future, but as of right now, July 2023, they're working with experienced sites only, but it doesn't take long to become an experienced site. We're going to get into that in this video. Next sponsor, Viva Site Vault. Free e-reg, free e-signatures, free e-delegation of duties log, anything you need free. You get a new CDA for a new study, you're going to start learning what those things are if you start getting studies. Get it signed in a few seconds, digitally, electronic signature, boom, send it to the sponsor or the CRO that's asking, absolutely free for inexperienced or experienced sites. The next sponsor, Versatrel. Once you start getting studies, it may not seem like a lot on your first study, but actually even is. But once you start getting two, three, four, five, and if you watch this video, you are going to start getting these studies quickly. You got to manage all these portals, all these passwords. You got to figure out what's the eCOA login for this, what link. Every study uses different vendors, by the way. So you might have nine vendors on one study, 12 vendors on another, seven vendors on a third, and they're all using a different IRB, a different EDC, a different IRT, whatever the case may be. Versatrial helps with all that for free. For free, it manages all these portals as long as you're keeping them active. It could even manage your passwords. And on even before you get the study, they have an awesome feasibility survey tool, which we're going to get into a little bit on this video, what feasibilities are. It remembers your information from your previous feasibilities, tedious things like address, phone numbers, emails. Can you use central IRB? Do you have this equipment, that equipment? It does all that for you for free. Finally, my last sponsor, the only one that's paid and not free, but I use, is Creo. E-source, E-reg, CTMS, patient database, everything in there. Relatively low fee. If you're a new site, I would consider starting with it first because it's a lot harder to switch later. So I highly recommend all these sponsors. Let's get into the show. The show is inspired by a comment I got recently. So... Hey, Dan, I've been following you for a bit. I am managing an SMO in nephrology, and half of our sites are research naive. We're having a tough time getting sponsors to be comfortable with new sites. Would love to pick your brain on this topic. Well, here we go. An SMO is like extra complicated. Chances are you're watching, you're just thinking about one site, one PI, and that's really, even if you are an SMO, the way to go. So, the PI that is not research, that that doesn't have research experience, so the physician, 
that doesn't have research experience, ideally, you want him or her to be on a sub investigator somewhere. Now, I realize for a lot of you guys and gals watching, that's not an option. You don't know anyone in your community that's doing research. Then you got to deep dive into their background. Did they ever do research in, in college and in university and med school? A lot of residency programs make the residents do research. So they're basically coordinators and they get relatively cheap labor out of the residents. It's terrible. It sounds just as bad as it is, but that's the way it is. You're going to have to dig into their background. Now, if you're at this SMO, you have other sites. So you can piggyback your physicians to be sub investigators when it actually makes sense and is appropriate. Let's say that's not the case. How do you boost up their experience without it? Well, there's several methods. Like I said, one of the services my company, BSCS, does and text me underneath if you're interested. We also have the links to the website. We find studies that our sponsors are willing to give to research naive sites, like survey studies, blood sample collection studies, phase four post-observational studies, real world studies. Try to get one of these studies. It's a lot easier. They don't pay as much but it's a lot easier to get accepted to be an investigator on one of these studies with no experience because what are they after in these cases? They're after volume, they're after patience, right? So ignore the fact that they don't pay that much, although some of them do. I know some sites that do nothing but lab collection studies and make a lot of money doing just lab collection studies. Well, my company, DSCS, we are connected with a few of these type of sponsors that are willing to work with research naive physicians. So that's why one of the things we do, one of the best things we're able to do for our sites is take someone who's research naive and get them experienced in research. And now they're up and running. Why? Because a study is a study. A PI is a PI. They're still an informed consent. As simple as the study may be, if it's a lab collection study or a phase four observational study or a real world study, there is an informed consent and there's good clinical practice. Once you get one of these studies under your belt, you're no longer research naive. Even if you have sub investigator or CRC experience as a physician, you're technically not research naive. Now in these feasibility surveys, which we mentioned, well, this is where they assess how you're gonna be on the trial. They might ask specifics, like do you have principal investigator experience? How many years? And then they, they, they'll break it down even further by getting into the therapeutic areas. Do you have experience as a principal investigator in depression trials, as an example, or in osteoarthritis trials? That's when you get into the, well, I do have experience. I've done survey studies, but no, I haven't done PI in this case. Always look to strengthen your case. So I have the first trial my PI here in Yuma Clinical Trials, the first study I was able to get for him, and they knew he was research naive, but, and this is another, this is another strategy for you guys. They knew he was research naive, but they knew that I had experience as the coordinator and the site director. And so they were more willing to give us the opportunity. But what really mattered to them was our access to the patients because my PI, has a huge private practice. And I mean, he's got a lot of the market share of the patients in Yuma, Arizona, going to his practice. So we had the database for this sponsor. We actually got a phase two study in dermatology. And he's not a dermatologist, but because he has the access to that database, they were willing to give him the chance because the sponsor was really behind on enrollment. So besides the studies I mentioned, you're probably gonna get difficult studies early on. So you're either gonna get very easy studies with these lab collection studies and these survey studies and these post-observational studies, or you're gonna get very difficult studies. You're gonna be what's called a rescue site, meaning a study's already going on, but they're having issues enrolling. And 
at DSCS, we know how to figure out, we can guess, we have a guess on which studies are behind on enrollment through clinicaltrials.gov. With experience, you can tell when the estimated enrollment was and the dates and when the estimated completion was. If you are if if you see something on clinicaltrials.gov that says estimated completion um 2024 and you're in 2024 and it's still ongoing, you can figure out. Now they don't update the numbers in real time, which is the, which is an issue. Another hint that you can look at is the complexity of the trial and the complexity of the inclusion exclusion criteria. So if it's a therapeutic indication that you have a lot of patients for, look at how complex the trial is and how strict the inclusion exclusion criteria is. I would actually prefer you look at how strict the inclusion exclusion criteria is first because you may not want an overly complex study as one of your first studies, but sometimes that's all you're gonna get. It was the case with me and my PI, we took an extremely complicated study. It was a dermatology study, but it had cardiovascular outcomes as the secondary endpoint. So why am I mentioning all this? A year later, when we applied for our first cardio study for the same PI, they asked, do you have cardio experience? Yes, we do. Because remember what I said, the dermatology study had a cardiovascular outcomes, important ones, as endpoints. So we put that in there. We didn't lie. We showed them what the study was. And then we explained these were the assessments we had to do, a lot of the same assessments in this study. And we were able to get the study. So that first trial, even if the therapeutic indication is not the same, is going to position you to get a lot more studies later on if you present it properly. The main issue is that patient database. Do not try, if you're starting a site, do not attempt to start a research clinic without a strategy for how you're going to get patients. 90% of your strategy, of your enrollment strategy, should come from a private practice of somebody, whether it's your PI or your sub-I or a close colleague of theirs, you have to have a strategy. This leads into the next point of how you can get trials. If you are a busy private practice, sales reps visit your doctor's office almost every day, at least on a weekly basis. These are key people to discuss research with, not because the sales rep is going to know what to tell you, but they're going to point you in the right direction. There's someone called a medical science liaison at every single pharmaceutical company, and they're the ones that are directly involved with the sales and with R&D. So th these medical science liaisons, they're, they're usually pharmacists or physicians or foreign trained physicians. They're clinicians by background, by training. They have one foot in research and development, one foot in sales. Just like the name implies, they're medical science liaisons. There's nothing better to an MSL than to hear this high prescribing physician is interested in doing research. They love that. Then the MSL is going to take over. You might set up a meeting with the MSL, usually on Zoom. Sometimes they'll come in person and tour your clinic. Plant these seeds. This doesn't happen overnight, by the way. We're talking a year, two years, three years, but you're planting seeds. Two of our best studies we've gotten, and we haven't even started them yet. So I don't know if they're our best, but on paper, they're our best. Came from medical science liaisons. Not from my company's services, which I love, right? Not from it, not from Hinata, the sponsor, which I love. It came from these medical science liaisons, but it would have never happened if myself, or in this case, my PI actually did it because I told him to do this. Reached out to the sales rep and said, hey, we want to be connected to the medical science liaison. Now, another thing you can be doing is, like I said, clinicaltrials.gov but take clinicaltrials.gov to the next level. So find a study where you think there's probably enrollment issues. If, a, if, if it's July, 2023, and you see a study that said, hey, we want 800 patients, and it started in July, 2018, 
so five years ago, and you see the inclusion exclusion criteria is insane, chances are, because 800 is a lot, they didn't meet the enrollment yet. So they're probably looking for rescue sites. So in those cases, what you want to do is, and this is what we do at DSCS for you, we'll send you leads every week. We do all this work I'm about to tell you. We do this all for you. And we just send you the leads presented, click to their LinkedIn profile, boom, contact these people. We also do initial outreach to all of them on your behalf to gauge their interest in just, do we need rescue sites? So you're going to be a rescue site. You, if you, they have an email address on clinicaltrials.gov, great. If they have a cell phone number, if there's a contact on there, great. Problem is they usually ignore these things. What's the next best thing to do? And even better, find this person or the contact on LinkedIn. Now, if it's a small enough biotech, which a lot of these studies are sponsored by biotechs, but this will even work on the bigger ones. It just takes a little more work. Go on LinkedIn and just look up that company. And then look, the algorithm will show you all the people. And you should update your LinkedIn profile to where your clinical research and your principal investigator, or if, if you're a site director, the algorithm should know that you're a clinical researcher. If not, then you want to type in the sponsor and clinical research. But either way, let's not complicate it. The point is look at the employees and then you're going to have to go through the profiles and say, okay, this person's probably someone I should talk to at this company about this study. There's usually titles like chief director of, of clinical research at sponsor XYZ or clinical project manager at sponsor XYZ or lead medical monitor at sponsor XYZ. You can figure it out. Message all these people. This is where LinkedIn Premium might come in handy because you. I think with the plan I have, I can message 30 people a month on LinkedIn without being connected to them. But if you don't want to pay for LinkedIn Premium, just send them a connection request with a short, I'm talking like two sentences, message saying, hey, I work with a clinician. They have this many patients in their database with this therapeutic condition that you do a study on, we would like to be considered as a site if you need more sites. That's it. Most of them will ignore you, but something interesting happens on LinkedIn because LinkedIn, people tend to respond more than emails. And if, you, if it's a study you really want, you want to connect with this person and start interacting with the posts that they put and maybe add interesting comments. But really just the second part that I mentioned, find the right people, reach out to them. You're gonna to need to do this 10 times a week, right? And I understand that's gonna take you over your LinkedIn credits. Because if you do it 10 times a week, that's 40 instead of 30. But for the last 10, just send them a connection request with a quick note. You don't wanna just generic copy and paste to everyone. Study what the study is about. If it's osteoarthritis, talk about why your physician might like this. Hey, I noticed your osteoarthritis study is an alternative to my physician's standard of treatment. He or she thinks this would be a great addition to their private practice. And you can get into more details if you want, but try to keep it two to three sentences. Usually two to three sentences is all you need. If they're interested, they're gonna ask you for more info. They're gonna send you a CBA, which you should put into your Viva Site Vault for free, get it signed by whoever needs to sign it and send it back to them instantly. They will send you the protocol synopsis and they will send you a feasibility survey, which then you could use VersaTrial to help you do your first feasibility survey. Pretty cool. So this is the process you wanna do over and over again. Again, if you pay for my services, we send you these leads. All you gotta do is click and we already did the initial outreach. But we do a generic outreach. Hey, we represent a network of sites. Are you interested in rescue sites? Before we even hear back, we send you the leads because a lot of these things go quick. So then you can click, okay, this is their LinkedIn. We want to email them. This is their email. Sometimes it's even a cell phone. Do that enough times. 
within three to six months, you should have a site selection visit. And now you're off. Now, biz dev is not something that you should take easy. You should relax. You're going to reach a point where you have enough studies to where you're busy. You should still, this is where Anato comes in. And this is where our services come in. You should still do some passive. And I'm talking like an hour or two a week max that someone at your site is doing business development and reaching out to sponsors to keep your pipeline full. Because you never know when a study is going to get canceled. A study just got canceled on me. You never know when the sponsor just decides, hey, you know what? We're not going to do this study. Boom. You never know when you're not going to be able to enroll. After everything you've told the sponsor, hey, we can enroll, you may be at a place where you can't find patients anymore. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have another study? So keep the pipelines full. This is where my company, the SES, comes in. This is where Anato comes in. Or if you're just doing it yourself, do it yourself. One to two hours a week once you have enough studies in your pipeline. At the beginning of your career as a research site owner or director, BizDev is like your only activity you should be doing. There's nothing else to do. Don't worry about getting a logo. The only exception would be get a website. So in those cases, like have a, just get a logo, okay? Get a logo. Don't spend time on this stuff is what I'm saying. Get a simple website, even if it's just a one-page website. The sponsors, if they are interested, they just want to see that you exist and that you're real, that you have an address and that you are connected to a physician who has a private practice. So that's, those are the strategies to get trials when you're brand new. It's, there's no easy way to do this. There's not a marketplace for research naive sites to where you can just sign up and be awarded studies. The closest thing we have to offer is the service we provide at DSCS. And then once you get some experience, stay with us because we do a whole bunch of other stuff besides the biz dev for free. It's the same price or someone like Inato once you have the experience. Links to both underneath. That's how you get a trial. It literally is a numbers game. Depending on the market, currently in clinical research, it's still busy, summer of 2023. But when we get into markets where it's not as busy, it's just going to take you longer. So what I said, three to six months initially to get your first site selection visit, it might take six to 12 months in a very slow market. Hopefully this helps. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Check out all the links below. Good luck.